Coming up on this Friday edition of Newsline at Noon. Despite the government's campaign to boost domestic demand, Korean consumers remain unwilling to spend following April's ferry disaster. A UN committee urges Japan to officially apologize for its wartime sexual enslavement of women and compensate the victims. Plus, the wreckage of an Algerian airliner that disappeared with 116 people on board has been found in Mali. It's the third plane crash in just over one week. These stories are more on Newsline at Noon. It's new Friday, July 25th here in Korea. Thanks for tuning in. Live from Seoul, I'm Oh jin -ju. It's very good to have you with us. I'm Mark Broom. Our top story this afternoon, Korea's consumer sentiment has taken two steps backwards in recent weeks and months. The index that measures the overall economic outlook of consumers remains fastened at the same level recorded in the weeks immediately following the Seoul Ho ferry disaster. This despite an improvement one month earlier. Now, officials say consumer sentiment is being affected by the central bank's recent downgrade of its economic outlook for this year as economic indicators reflected the aftermath of the ferry tragedy. Hwang Jie has the details. The Korean government is putting forth its best efforts to shore up economic sentiment, but so far those efforts are not bearing fruit. The Bank of Korea said Friday that the nation's consumer sentiment index stood at 105 in July, down two points from a month earlier. The figure had rebounded in June, suggesting that Korean consumers might be returning to their spending habits, which changed after April's ferry tragedy. The index hovered at around the 108 level in the first four months of this year, but dropped to 105 in May following the disaster. The figure returned to that level this month, and experts say that reflects the nation's still sluggish domestic demand. The monthly index is a gauge of the overall economic outlook of consumers, their living conditions and future spending plans. A reading over 100 means optimists outnumber pessimists. A recent poll by Nielsen showed that Korea's consumer sentiment is near the bottom among 60 countries worldwide. The figures cast a cloud over President Park's new economic team and their attempts to pull the economy out of a low-growth rut by boosting domestic demand. While announcing plans to pump money into the economy in the second half of this year, Finance Minister Choi Kyung-hwan also pledged to map out the budget for next year in an expansionary manner. Hwang Jie, Arirang News. Now, with the government's new economic team announcing its expansionary fiscal policy on Thursday, pressure is building on the central bank to follow suit. With domestic demand slumping and economic growth at a standstill, speculation is growing that the central bank may cut its interest rate next month for the first time in more than a year. Kim Jian reports. There's growing speculation the Bank of Korea will cut its interest rate in the latter half of this year, perhaps as early as next month. The government is reportedly pressuring the central bank to lower the rate, which has been kept at 2.5 percent for 14 straight months, in order to boost its expansionary fiscal and monetary policies. The nation's new economic team, led by Finance Minister Choi kyung hwan announced on Thursday a $40 billion stimulus plan to spur growth by inducing spending and promoting corporate activity. The government request for a rate cut comes partly because it's too late to increase the supplementary budget, which could have been used to raise capital for the stimulus plan. The speculation of a rate cut is also being fueled by recent economic figures. The central bank announced Thursday that the economic growth rate in the second quarter inched up by a mere 0.6 percent from the previous quarter, lower than previous estimates. Those that support a rate cut say the move will induce domestic consumption, which was attributed as the main reason for the lack of growth from April to June. The plan is to reduce the amount of debt repayments, thus increasing the spending power of households. But some experts say cutting the interest rate is a double-edged sword that would actually increase household debt in the longer term and ultimately constrain domestic demand, since the policy would open the door for households to spend more, despite their growing debt. 
The stimulus plan can only be successful when it's combined with a monetary policy, such as an interest rate cut. However, cutting the interest rate could also worsen household debt. The Bank of Korea's next rate-setting meeting is scheduled for August 14th. Kim Jeong, Arirang News. Before voters head to the polls for Korea's largest ever by-elections next Wednesday, a two-day early voting has started today. The polls opened at 6 this morning, beginning the race that has greater significance coming off local elections in June, where no party could claim victory. Connie Kim reports. Two days of early voting for the July 30th by-elections has begun. Those that cast ballots today and tomorrow will help determine the winners in Korea's largest ever by-elections, where 15 parliamentary seats are up for grabs. Six of the vacant seats are in Seoul and Gyeonggi-do province, and analysts say winning the upper hand in those races may very well determine who won the greater election. And according to the last opinion poll results released on Wednesday, the ruling Saenuri party is in the poll position. In Seoul's Dongjakbi constituency, considered a barometer of public sentiment in the capital, the ruling party candidate is in the lead. However, there's a lot of road between now and next Wednesday. Two opposition candidates bowed out of their respective races on Thursday to circle the wagons around the liberal candidate. The field has narrowed in the Dongjakbi race, where at last check, the ruling party candidate Na Gyeongwon had an overwhelming lead. Candidate Ki Dong-min of the main opposition party has dropped out and thrown his support behind the Justice Party candidate No Hye Chan in hopes of boosting the opposition's chance of winning. The Justice Party candidate in the Suwon-di constituency of Gyeonggi-do province also dropped his candidacy on Thursday, making it largely a two-horse race between the ruling party's Im Tae-hee and the main opposition's Park kwang on Connie Kim, Arirang News. It seems that the cause of the death of fugitive Seoul ferry owner Yu byung un will remain a mystery. Korea's National Forensic Service says the body was far too de decomposed for them to determine what caused him to die. In a nationally televised press briefing earlier this morning, the director of the agency said they failed to find whether Yu had died of disease or he had been strangled to death as there was too little evidence left on his body. The agency, which had been running tests on the corpse since receiving it on Tuesday, did manage to rule out the possibility that Yu had died from drugs or from being poisoned. The state forensic agency also reaffirmed that the body was in fact that of the fugitive ferry owner amid growing public suspicions the body might not be his. Yu, who disappeared shortly after the Seodo ferry disaster, was found dead last month in an orchard in southwestern Korea. Now, a UN panel is urging Japan to provide a public apology and compensation to the victims of its wartime system of sex slavery. This call comes as two elderly victims from Korea continue their mission in the United States to raise awareness about the horrors they faced. Park ji -won reports. Two victims of Japan's wartime system of sexual slavery visited the city of Glendale in California this week. It's where a monument dedicated to them and the thousands of other victims a bronze statue of a young girl dressed in traditional Korean clothing is set up. Please help us, the victims, receive an apology from the Japanese government before we all die. Lee ok says she was abducted by Japanese soldiers when she was only 15 and sent to a military brothel. To this day, the Japanese government denies its military operated the brothels, despite a huge amount of evidence that shows the military did. The two women, now in their late 80s, spoke out against some Japanese Americans and Japanese officials who want the statue removed. They are saying really inhumane things. Both women will stay in the U.S. for another couple of weeks. They will travel to Virginia and New Jersey and to other monuments set up in memory of all those who suffered under Japan's cruel system of sexual slavery. Meanwhile, a U.N. panel is urging Japan to provide a public apology and compensation to the victims of its wartime sex slave victims before it's too late. 
The UN Human Rights Committee said Thursday, after reviewing the records of several countries, it's concerned about the re-victimization of the former sex slavery victims. The panel criticized the Japanese government for continuously denying its responsibility and even defaming the victims, rather than taking the necessary steps to help them. The committee, made up of 18 independent experts, also noted that every compensation claim brought by victims has been dismissed and every call to ask for independent investigation on the sex slavery has been rejected in Japan. Park Ji-won, Arirang News. Now to some developing news. Authorities have tracked down the wreckage of the Algerian passenger plane that crashed in southern Mali on Thursday. There are no signs of survivors. Connie Lee reports. A plane that went missing early Thursday has been found. The wreckage of Air Algerie Flight 5017 has been spotted in Mali, according to officials. The team has confirmed it has seen the remains of the plane, totally burned out and scattered on the ground. Sadly, the team saw no one on site. It saw no survivors. It is possible that some parts of the aircraft were seen by locals in done areas near the village of Bosi in Mali. All this information will be confirmed after inquiries. It was supposed to be a four-hour overnight flight from Wagodagu to Algiers, Algeria. But the flight, carrying 116 people on board, including French and Spanish nationals, lost radar contact just 50 minutes after takeoff. Bad weather is being suspected as a cause. The flight had asked to change its route before losing contact because of a storm. The Air Algerie crash is the third plane disaster in a week. Malaysia Airlines Flight 17 was brought down by a service-to-air missile in Ukraine one week ago. And Taiwan's TransAsia Flight 222 crashed amid inclement weather on Wednesday. The death toll from all three crashes exceeds 400. Connie Lee, Adirang News. Time now for a look through some of the other international headlines we're following on this Friday. For that, we turn to our Eunice Kim standing by at the News Center. Now, Eunice, the conflict in the Middle East between Israel and Hamas is only ratcheting up. Now, a United Nations school in Gaza full of civilians has become one of the latest sites of a deadly, deadly Israeli strike. That's right, Mark. That's, of course, where scores of Palestinians had sought refuge after fleeing Israel's deadly assault on Gaza. At least 15 people are reported dead, mostly women and children, and more than 200 others injured, this being the fourth attack on a U.N. facility since the start of this conflict. Pools of blood were spotted in the school's courtyard, also scattered pillows, blankets, and children's clothing. Palestinian officials had blamed Israel for the shelling. U.N. Secretary General Ban Ki-moon from Cairo said he was shocked and appalled by what happened at the U.N. school. He reiterated the impassioned message he and U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry have been sending to the leadership of Israel and Palestine. It's morally, morally wrong to kill your own people. The whole world is, has been watching, is watching with great concern. You must stop fighting and enter into a dialogue. Whatever grievances you may have, this is wrong. Israel's defense forces confirmed it had been engaged in combat with Hamas terrorists in the area of Beit Hanun, who were hiding arms and fighters in civilian areas. It said it was reviewing the incident while raising the possibility that a Hamas rocket could be to blame. Gaza health officials say nearly 120 Palestinians were killed in Thursday's fighting, marking the bloodiest day so far. 32 Israeli soldiers, two civilians and a Thai worker in Israel have been killed in rocket fires so far. 
Two military aircraft carrying 74 more caskets have arrived at Eindhoven military base in the Netherlands Thursday. It came one day after the first 40 remains of the victims of Flight 17 landed to a military honor guard and transported for forensic identification. This as human remains continue to be found in the crash zone a full week after the plane was presumably shot down by pro-Russian rebels. Australian and Dutch diplomats joined to push a plan that would have a UN team to secure that crash site, which has been controlled by the rebels. All 298 people aboard Malaysia Airlines Flight 17 were killed, most of them Dutch citizens, when the plane was shot down on July 17th. And some business news now. One day after it cut the economic outlook for the U.S. economy, the International Monetary Fund has slashed its global growth forecast for 2014 as well. It said the world economy should expand by 3.4 percent this year, down three-tenths of a percent from its April forecast. The lending organization cited weaker growth in the U.S., China, and several key emerging markets for this move. It urgently called for both advanced and emerging market governments to adapt structural reforms that would make their economies more competitive. Stay up to date on the latest news out of Korea, connecting to our team of reporters about the issues that matter to Korea. On air, on your mobile, online. Find out more about Korea on Newsline at Noon with Mark Broom and Oh Jin Ju. Relations between the United States and Russia are at their lowest ebb in years over the crisis in Ukraine, but there is another potential flashpoint developing here in Northeast Asia. It involves Washington's plan to deploy an advanced missile defense system in South Korea, and Russia is not happy about that. But as our Shinsen Min reports, the U.S. says the missile defense system will not target Russia. The U.S. will press ahead with plans to deploy a high-altitude anti-ballistic missile defense system in South Korea to defend against North Korea's continuous missile threats. The U.S. government on Thursday dismissed Russia's concerns that the deployment of the Terminal High Altitude Area Defense Battery, or THAAD, could trigger an arms race in Northeast Asia and make it more difficult to resolve issues. Russia's foreign ministry said the plan will inevitably have a negative impact on the region. Responding to that, the U.S. State Department stressed the defense system is not aimed at Russia. It added the U.S. is committed to missile defense cooperation with Moscow, which will eventually enhance the security of NATO and Russia. The top commander for U.S. forces in Korea asked the Pentagon in June to deploy THAAD to Korea. Study, but there's consideration um, uh, being taken in order to uh, consider THAAD being deployed here in, in Korea. It was a U.S. initiative. In fact, I recommended it as the commander. With North Korea's evolving threat, we obviously continuously look at ways that we can improve the defense of South Korea. In May, the Wall Street Journal reported that Washington had conducted a site survey for possible deployment locations for the THAAD system, but no final decision had been made. THAAD, a key part of the U.S. missile defense system, can intercept enemy forces' mid-range ballistic missiles in mid-air. Shin Se-min, Arirang News. North Korea has filed an official complaint with the United Nations claiming the latest U.N. Security Council resolution on the regime's short-range missile launches is unjustified. According to Yanam News Agency, the letter sent earlier this week claims it's unfair and intolerable for the global body to criticize Pyongyang for firing short-range missiles as it's purely defensive in nature. North Korea claimed the U.N. is turning a blind eye to the joint military drills between Seoul and Washington, which it says is clearly aimed at attacking the North, and added the issue must be addressed by the Security Council. In response, South Korea said the U.N. has no plans to call a meeting despite Pyongyang's request. 
And moving on to the only sector of cooperation between the two Koreas, South Korea's small and medium sized businesses are considering investing in a new economic free trade zone in North Korea. They're hoping to build another joint industrial complex like the one in Kaesong, but they're saying there are sites further north. Kim Young Gil reports. The Korea Federation of Small and Medium Business announced Thursday that it's considering building an industrial complex in North Korea's Najin Sambong free trade economic regions. Federation Chairman Kim Ki moon said at a policy forum in China on Thursday that at the request of Korea's small and medium sized firms, the group is currently reviewing plans. The new complex will likely be similar to the Inter Korean Industrial Park located in Kaesong, which currently stands as the prototype for economic integration between the two Koreas and a symbol of possible reunification. Chairman Kim said the project, dubbed the Second Kaesong Industrial Complex, is looking to build on 3.3 million square meters of land at a suitable location near the Najin Sambong development regions, since it is close to the borders of China and Russia. The Business Federation says it plans on making a trip to North Korea in the near future to meet with officials and discuss further ideas on investment and developments for a potential deal. Kim Young-gil, Arirang News. Beginning this Friday, the first payout under Korea's new basic pension program rolls out following a series of disputes over who can claim it. The National Pension Service says senior citizens over the age of 65 in the lowest 70 percent income bracket will receive a monthly allowance ranging between 100,000 to 200,000 won or roughly 96 to 194 U.S. dollars. Among the 4.1 million people who can claim, 93% will receive the full benefit of $194 per person. If they're a married couple, they get $310. Around 23,000 senior citizens will not be eligible because they are either supported by their children, own country club memberships and or luxury automobiles. Now, nearly one in ten of Korea's senior citizens are likely to suffer from some type of dementia a rate that's much higher than neighboring countries. New findings from Seoul National University Bundang Hospital show the prevalence rate for dementia among Koreans aged 65 and above stands at 9.2%. That's more than two times higher than the average of 4.2% for all of Southeast Asia and higher than China's rate of 7.6%. The researchers analyzed 11 journals on dementia between 1990 and 2013. Alzheimer's was the most prevalent form at 5.7%. These findings were published in the July edition of the Journal of Korean Medical Science. Now, Korea's rapid rate of economic development in recent decades has corresponded to a better quality of life. The UN Development Programme ranks Korea 15th out of 187 countries in its Human Development Index. The index measures the long-term outlook for three dimensions of human development, namely a long and healthy life, access to knowledge and a decent standard of living. Norway topped the list, followed by Australia and Switzerland. The Korean government has released a list of the country's most competitive enterprises in the field of planning and design. The Ministry of Trade, Industry and Energy designated 18 SMEs as K-Brain Powers, which refers to top companies that create added value with their strategic planning and innovative ideas. Among those selected is software company Midas IT, which has the largest global market share in the industry of engineering design software for structural uh, analysis. The ministry also announced its plan to invest five million US dollars to help those top selected brain companies in their research and development. It also earmarked an additional six hundred thousand dollars for recruitment of talented workforce from overseas. The ministry will also heighten the nation's industry structure and support a total of 300 companies by the year 2018.
Good Friday afternoon. I'm Lee ji with your weather update. Well, on and off heavy rain will continue throughout the day. In the upper parts of the peninsula, we can expect to have 20 to 60 millimeters of showers, while the southern regions will have 5 to 40 millimeters of monsoon rain. So clouds and rain will be the main theme for today and it should be slightly cooler than yesterday across the region as the high Seoul will rise to 29 while Taegu and Gwangju will peak at 32 and 31 and Busan will hike up to 29 this afternoon. And for other regions, it looks like Jeju Island will see a high of 32, Daejeon and Dukdo will climb to 31 and 28 while Mount Kungang Tops out at 20. Well, I'm sure some of you are getting tired of the monsoon rain by now, but we'll have to stick it out for another day or so as the monsoon front will continue affecting it by tomorrow morning. Well, that's all for Korea, and here's the international weather for viewers around the world. Those are the stories we're following at this hour. Jinju and I will be back at the same time on Monday. Enjoy your weekend and we'll see you then.